it's good to virtually be uh, at FrontConf today. So thank you so much. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about delivering video that doesn't break the bank. And Stefan was a great intro to this because um, he mentioned this as well. But my sim, I got the chance to go to Serbia, and data was uh, four euros a megabyte. And obviously, um, for a, the average web page, which is 1.7 megabytes, you're talking all you know seven to ten uh, euros for every single page load. Uh, things get dramatically, dramatically worse once we start talking about video. And you know, in the last week, things have changed a whole lot, as I'm sure we're all really, really aware. So I also want to talk today about delivering video that isn't going to break the internet, um, because like um, this is a, this is a news article from yesterday, right? The EU is asking YouTube and Netflix to stream in SD uh, because if everybody's watching Netflix in HD, they're worried that they're going to break the internet, right? Like this is. This is current events, right? Um, Austria is has given the green light to throttle streaming video. Um, they're going to be able to. This is what they do in America, but they can throttle streaming video, so you won't get 4K video. They're going to the government's going to decide what video you're getting um, because they're worried that the internet's going to break. Um, you know, January use versus use the beginning of last week huge jumps in data traffic and you know a lot of this is because of video and like the best blog post out there that talks about video usage and really keeps up with current events um let's just say it throws off my browsing history um but like Pornhub has really great stats on this and you can see that um over the last two weeks the amount of people using video on this website has grown dramatically, like five to 10% uh, change in usage compared to an average day. Like more and more people are consuming video today than they were last week, than they were a year ago. And we knew this trend was growing, but it's like exploded in the last month. So I'm Doug. I talk about developer relations. Uh, I do a lot with performance, making native apps, making websites faster. I do lead workshops on images, video, augmented reality. I wrote a book on um, Android uh, performance. So if you're interested in that, you can download the PDF. If you want to reach out, I'll be on the Slack channel all day today. Um, but if you want to reach out to me, otherwise, I'm on Twitter or Gmail. I have a website. I'm the only Doug Sillers on the internet. But why video? So this is from Wistia. Wistia found that people spend more time on pages with video than without video. And gotta take this with a grain of salt because Wistia is trying to convince you that you should embed Wistia video on your web page. It also sort of makes sense that if people watch a video, they're gonna stay on the page longer than if they were just reading the text because a video tends to be a minute long or something, so they'll be on the page a little bit longer. Um, but what that tells you is people, if they watch a video, they are probably more engaged with your content. So let's figure out what we can do to add video to your web page. Well, HTML5 has the video tag and it's awesome. Um, you can't just add a video like this. It doesn't work. Um, and this won't work on mobile. So if you add autoplay, um, this won't work because on auto, um, and sometimes videos won't autoplay. Each browser has a different algorithm to decide whether a video will autoplay or not. So for example, CNN, the videos won't autoplay unless you press play on a video at CNN. And then the browser's like, ah, oh, Doug went to CNN. He likes the videos there and now they autoplay. So it's really hard to test how this works because as soon as you press play, you screwed around with the settings in your browser and changes things. If you want your video to autoplay on mobile, you have to add the muted parameter. So this will autoplay on mobile. And so the reason this autoplays on mobile is the last thing you want to have happen when you're in a crowded room of people and you're not really paying attention, right? You don't want that video to autoplay with sound because then you're busted um, that you haven't been paying attention. So video will autoplay only if it's muted on mobile. You can add or remove controls. That's the play button at the bottom, the, the bar across 
Um, if you add the controls, you'll see it. If you don't add it, there'll be no controls. So if you don't want controls, like for a background video, you can remove this attribute and it won't show up. You can change the width, you can change the height, right? Um, if you would like to have a, uh, if the video isn't going to play, you can have a poster that appears. Instead of a black screen or the first frame of the video, you can pick which frame you want. You can picture a totally different image and have that display on the box with the play button in the middle. If you'd like your video to loop, this you can actually have it autoplay, muted, and loop, which means it'll play to the end and start back at the beginning again. This is an analogy to an animated GIF, right? This could be an animated GIF, but it's really a video. If you go to Twitter, we see animated GIFs all the time on Twitter, right? Like here's, you know, here's Ethan with his, with his GIF. You can see in the corner it says GIF. Um, but if you open it up in DevTools, it's actually a movie. So GIF the format they're using, but they're not, act, or GIF the, they're not using GIF the format, they're using GIF the idea. I guess, right? So um, Twitter, Facebook, Slack, if you see an animated GIF, it's actually a looping movie. Um, and the reason it's a looping movie is if you look over here, it's behind all the video things on my screen. I'm just gonna move that out of the way. It's uh, 400K, right? So a 400K movie versus like a couple megabyte GIF is gonna be a lot smaller. Um, if you actually read the spec for animated GIF, um, back from 1990, it says the animated GIF is available, but we don't recommend that anyone uses it. So like the spec says we shouldn't use animated GIFs and looping movies are faster. Um, so this is what we should do for movies. Another thing we can do with the HTML5 tag for video is we can add the preload tag. Um, and there's three options for the preload tag. Preload equals none says, hey, I've got a video don't download any of the video, like just don't download it. Um, preload equals metadata is the default in all browsers. And what that says is, hey, there's a video, download the first five to 10% of it. All right, and so you see in Safari, this same page, once I change it to metadata, now we've got like a 600K of video that were downloaded. There's a further option and that's preload equals auto. And this is one that you should really use with caution because what this tells the browser is, I don't care if they watch the video or don't watch the video, download the whole thing. So have you ever been on a mobile page where you see a video and you're like, well, I'm not really sure I wanna watch the video because I don't wanna you know, impact my data plan or you know, my battery's really low, I don't wanna download the whole video. If the developer has added preload equals auto, they've, they've solved that for you and they just download the whole thing no matter how, what, you, what your personal feelings as the user are towards that. Um, so you can have multiple sources, right? So you can have a WebM, which is a different format. It's a more modern format. It generally compresses a little bit better than MP4. So if you wanna have different formats, the first one, this is just like the picture tag, the first one that the browser understands is the one it'll play. Um, virtually every browser understands MP4. I think it's like Opera Mini and probably really, really old browsers uh, that don't support video. And then they'll get this fallback, your browser does not support video. Um, you might think you could do media queries with video, right? So we, this is what we do with images. And Stefan had an example of this earlier where you know, with a different width, you can serve a big movie. If it's a smaller screen, you can serve a small movie. Um, don't try this at home because it doesn't work for the video tag. Um, it just doesn't work, it's been removed. Um, the trick for here is to go to streaming video. If I've got time at the end, we'll talk a little bit about streaming video. Um, so let's talk about video delivery. This is the Trump Tower website. I haven't checked it in a couple of weeks, but this is the Trump Tower website a couple of weeks ago. And there's a background video that plays here. Um, and so this is the HTML. And if we look at it, what we have here is we have a video for desktop, it's muted autoplay in loop. But we also have a video for mobile, which is muted autoplay in loop. And you can see that we've got Trump Power MP4 and Trump Tower Mobile.mp4. So the issue with this is, of course, we have two separate video tags, which means we download two separate videos desktop and mobile. You're talking 20 megabytes of video um, because 
it's sort of like, we don't know what to do, so we'll just let the browser figure it out. Not ideal, right? What we would really like on mobile is serve six megabytes of video, leave it at that. Um, don't serve 20 and then only let them see six. A second example, this is a video um, that is loop muted autoplay, right? So this is a background. You can actually see the name of it is bg.mp4. This is a background video. Okay, so they've got a background video that's going to autoplay, but they have a poster. And so what ends up happening here is the browser's like, oh, there's a poster. We're going to download the poster, but also download the video at the same time. And so what ends up happening is this poster is 250K, and it is being downloaded at the same time as the video, so it's actually delaying the video appearing on the screen. The poster never actually shows up because it goes straight into the video. So we're just wasting 250 kilobytes here. We should, if you're going to autoplay a video, you don't need the poster tag in general. Um, the third example, I don't have this open, but um, this is a chronic issue with most mobile web pages, is that rather than show the video on mobile devices, they use uh, video display none. And so what that means is on smaller screens, the um, video doesn't show up, but unfortunately display none does not mean download none. So the browser sees a, uh, that, there's good, that it needs to request this MP4 uh, video, uh, but then the CSS hides it. And so what we end up getting is a four megabyte download of this background video that no one on mobile can actually ever see. And we'll just do it here. Let's just go live and um, I'll put on dev tools and we'll go to a smaller screen. We'll go to climb Iowa, right? We will look for media files as this downloads. They've closed, that's really too bad. Maybe they've removed the video because they've temporarily closed. I'm not seeing the video. Ah, all right, live examples failing on me. Let's go responsive and see if the video appears when I make the screen bigger. Nope, they've removed the video because they are closed. All right, so again, um, coronavirus screws up my live demo. <laughs> but previously they were downloading a four, four megabytes of the video downloads on mobile devices, even though it wasn't being shown. And this is chronic. This is on most every single website that has video. Um, fourth example, again, this is a video that has a play button. Um, once you it preload equals auto. And so what this thing is saying is no matter what, download this whole video um, for every single user. And if you look at the source, it's 90 seconds long and ouch, 88 megabytes, right? This thing is gonna be huge. Um, on my mobile device, you can see, um, I think it shows, yeah, it shows that it was 61 megabytes before Chrome gave up. Um, so like, Chrome gave up, but still was 61 megabytes for a video that I might never even press play to see. So preload equals auto is awesome. Use it with discretion. If you're like 90, 95% sure people are gonna watch your video, by all means use preload equals auto. But if you're not really sure, you're just wasting data. Um, when it comes to video performance, there are a few parameters that people are really interested in. And this is like what analytics companies for video actually look at. Does the video start? Uh, did the video stall, right? We all know that when a video stops playing mid, mid playback, it's frustrating. And does it look good? Um, if we optimize the video we're delivering, we can fix all of these problems. Um, this is a study from years ago from Akamai. And what they found is everyone hangs out when they press play, everyone hangs out for two seconds. You've got two seconds to get that video to start playing. Every second afterwards, you lose 6% of your viewers. Um, so how do you measure the start times? So hopefully many of you are familiar with web page test. Web page test is like the most awesome tool for web performance out there. Um, this is the waterfall diagram. These are all of the requests and you can see everything loading. This long green line is the background video. And what this is telling you is there's a video that's being downloaded and it's back here, but it doesn't actually tell you if it's loading or not. 
and that's a problem. Um, so how do we measure if it's loading? Well, web page test lets you have a video to see if it's loading. So we can see if this video is going to load. Let's see how this does. So how many people load a web page and you're sitting there and you're like, I wonder if there's a video at the top of this web page. Maybe I'll just hang out and see if there's a video. Right, no one's gonna hang out 23 seconds to see if there's a video on the web page, right? That's just ridiculous. I'm trying to hit pause, but all right, there we go. Anyway, no one's gonna wait 20 seconds for a video to start up. So that's really a bad idea. <clears throat> all right, so how do we measure the start time of a video? So I built a tool, it's called Stream or Not. That's the URL, it's hosted up on GitHub. You paste in the URL of your, of your video, of your MP4, and it will tell you how quickly your video starts. It'll tell you your connection speed if you're on Chrome. Um, it'll tell you the size of the video. It'll tell you how much video is in the buffer, how much was downloaded onto your phone or onto your, into your browser before the video started playing. In this case, it took 1.3 seconds to start playing. We're happy, right? It's under two seconds. Everyone's going to watch that video. Um, while WebHHS is awesome, it can't give you that granularity. It's not built to measure when the video starts playing. Um, Granted, we're only looking at the video. When you build a web page, you've got other stuff downloading, CSS, JavaScript, all those other things. <clears throat> you can add parameters. You can make it download like 99 other images to try to like constrict the network speed to make it slower. Um, so you can play around with that if you're interested. Uh, <coughs> it is just a synthetic test. Um, but it, it's gonna get you some idea of how you're doing. If you load this with Chrome DevTools, you can change the network speed and see how things are loading. All right, so we can see now how fast the video, how quickly it starts. Can we measure if a video stalls? Oh, someone's saying something. All right, anyway. All right, so this is data from Conviva. And so Conviva has, is a analytics company that measures how quickly uh, videos start. And, well, they measure everything about videos, and this is startup data. And they found that 3% of videos just don't start at all. And then a bunch of people quit watching it before it starts up because it's taking too long. I think most of the videos don't start because of things like this, right? Geolocation. This CBS video doesn't load up in Europe because it's geocentric just to America. Um, of course, this video spent three megabytes and 231 requests to tell me that I couldn't watch it. Um, I always go back to Amazon Prime for the best example of how to avoid this. If you know your customer is in a location where they can't see the video, don't let them even press play to see it. Just say, hey, we notice that you're not in this area. You can't watch this video until you get back to America. So if you have Amazon Prime video, it actually looks at where you are and shows the videos you can watch when you're in that location. And if there's something really hot that people are talking about on Amazon that they can't show you while you're in Croatia or while you're in Germany, they'll say, you know, you can watch this when you get back to America or when you get back to the UK or, you know, whatever it is, they will help you um, understand why you can't watch that video. But what's really interesting is this, like 16% of videos on mobile, people give up on and like 25% people give up on, on desktop. Now imagine if as web page developers, if we lost one sixth to one quarter of all of our users, right? We'd all be out of a job. Um, the reason this is failing is that it's taking a long time for these videos to start up. So if it takes a long time for videos to start up, we know that we're gonna lose people because they're just not gonna wait that long. Um, some more startup stuff. I thought I was getting into stalling. All right, but anyway, my slides got a little out of order. Um, so one thing that, really has a huge issue with uh, the startup time is um, the bit rate of the video. So you can look to see how many megabytes per second your video is being delivered, and then you can see if it's gonna actually stream. And so what I found is startup time for videos, if it has a low bit rate, so this is the lower 50% of bit rates, they're more likely to start up in under six seconds. Whereas if you have a high bit rate, they're not gonna start up in under six seconds. 
<clears throat> I've blogged about this. So if you're interested in all the data, you can look it all up. Um, so imagine you've got this five megabit per second video. This is actually the background video for the college I went to in Ohio. Um, and, but you're watching it on three megabit um, Wi-Fi. Um, it's not going to play. We know it's not going to play because there's more video than there is bandwidth for this video to play. Now, if it's on fast Wi-Fi, it's going to work. That'll work. And we're going to actually see this video play. Um, so let's look at video stalling. Um, so if a video is stalling, uh, we know that people are going to drop off. You know, we don't want to see this. Stalling is really, really bad. Um, I can measure stalling with this stream or not tool. So if you lower your network connection with, you know, with your dev tools and then load up your video in here, we can measure how much video is in the buffer. And I kind of arbitrarily came up with these numbers. If you have less than five seconds of video in the buffer, um, you're in the danger mode. If you're between five and 10, it's low. And I say, if you have 10 seconds of video stored locally, you're probably all right. It's probably not going to stall. Um, but the tool will also measure when it stalled and how long it stalled and how many times it stalls over time. And obviously, any stall is going to be bad. If you stall, even if it's just for like 100 milliseconds, people notice that. And it like suspends that, you know, you're sort of in this suspension of reality when you're watching a movie. And as soon as it starts hitching, um, you just, it doesn't work as well. Like you, people, your customers get frustrated. What I found looking at videos from the HTTP archive is 40% uh, of videos experienced a stall on a 3G connection. 20% um, of them are two seconds or longer and 10% were over 10 seconds, right? We can imagine that if we've got a 10 second stall, um, no one's watching, right? You, you've lost everybody, you know? So we're, we can assume that 20% of videos, we've pretty much lost everybody. Two seconds of stalling, people are gonna give up. Um, and you know, what I found is we can't blame the network speed, especially now with everybody on the network, everybody's watching video. Um, what we can do is we can modify the video size by changing the dimensions and lowering the bit rate. So what can we do to resize a video? So I'm going to use Cloudinary here because it's a really easy tool to resize videos and I'll show you why. I found this, vi <clears throat> this video, it was live on a website. And the MP4 is, um, it's 1080p, so it's 1920 uh, pixels wide. It's 73 megabytes and 20 megabits per second. They try to serve this on mobile, right? This isn't going to work. We know this is just not going to work. Um, so there's some quality settings you can use. Uh, there are quality settings built into FFmpeg. Um, they use CRF, constant rate factor. If you use 23, which is the default, you're going to get numbers very similar to what I'm showing here uh, with Cloudinary. But by just doing that, I was able to make the video 10% the original size, you know, give or take. And the bit rate drops to 10%, right? This is now more likely to stream on a connection, right? Your slow hotel Wi-Fi, uh, the house network that you're now sharing with all of your family members because everybody's at home, right? We want to make sure that the bit rate is low enough that it'll actually play back on the network you have. Um, you can also serve it as a WebM and you make a little bit additional savings. Um, if I resize that video to 720p, so one thing about videos, they measure the height. So 1280 wide is 720 high, which is 720p. Again, we're down to 1.3 megabits per second, four megabyte size video. The change in quality, which we'll talk about, is still very, very small. So it still looks awesome. Um, what we see is the video startup drops dramatically when we go, once, once we optimize the quality, right? We're spending very little time in that danger zone or we're still spending 50% of our time in the danger zone, but it starts in 14 seconds. It starts in three seconds when it's 720p and we only spend a third of the time in that danger zone, right? We can definitely speed up the delivery. The video speed, start delivering faster it's less likely to stall just by resizing the video. One more thing. So this video that I'm talking about here that was 73 megabytes over the wire live on the web. If we look at their HTML, they have an MP4, but they also have a WebM. 
Now, if you remember earlier in the talk, I talked about how um, the browser is going to pick the first format that it understands. Um, every browser understands MP4, so every single browser is going to serve that MP4. This WebM down here, sitting hidden where no browser will ever see it, is half the size, but no one ever actually sees it. So to fix that, you just flip them, and you put the WebM first, you put the MP4 second, and you just improved the performance of your web page for 78% of the global community, according to Can I Use It? Right? Web I, WebM is supported by 78% of, of browsers out there. So, like, we just made the web page better. The other thing to look at here is they are hosting this video um, on Amazon S3. And Amazon S3 is great, it's a great place to host things like this, um, but it isn't free. Right? I talk about a little bit about how videos can cost users a lot of money if they're roaming and on expensive roaming plans, or if they're on limited data plans or things like that. Um, but it can also cost you, um, because S3 costs nine cents a gigabyte, which of course means that this video, full-size MP4, costs half a US cent every single time somebody loads the web page. Simply switching the WebM first you know, drops it to a third of a cent, um, but if they did that optimized video that I showed you earlier, where they made it 720p um, and they did some quality adjustments, they could get it down to four thousandths of a US cent. And so, of course, the clickbait headline that you would write for this is how you can lower your AWS bill by 15x with this one simple trick. Simply by optimizing your videos, right? This is still an MP4. This isn't even going to WebM. This will work for all browsers. Um, it's 15 times less money than your AWS bill just for one video. Um, other things that we can do, and this you can do with, with Cloudinary here, I'm removing the audio codec. Um, by simply removing the audio codec, I made the video 4% smaller. So think about your background video. Think about your videos that you're looping to make it look like an animated GIF. Those are all silent, right? You probably don't even have controls that people turn on the audio. So if it's not gonna have any audio, remove the audio track and you'll make your video usually about 5% smaller. Removing the sound doesn't actually remove the audio track. Um, there'll still be like this empty track that takes up space that's still downloaded. So actually remove the audio track so there's just a video track and you'll make your video smaller. So we can make our videos smaller. We know how to make our videos smaller, but how can we make sure the video still looks good? Right? So if we talk about streaming, we want to put our feet in a stream that looks like this. We don't want to put our feet in a stream that looks like this. There are actually a lot of tools out there that will help us with that. There's structural similarity. This one in Emmy in 2015. It's always fun to talk about quality and performance tools that like win awards. There's peak signal to noise. I'm going to talk about video multi-method assessment fusion. I'm going to call it VMAF because that's just a lot easier. Um, these are all scores, things we can run um, automatically and, and just test our videos. The, the mean opinion score is like the things that you see at the airport was like how clean was the bathroom or how dirty was the bathroom. This is like judged by people. Um, but basically, if you get a VMAF score of like 93 to 95, the quality is still excellent. If you get a VMAF score of 70, it's all right. Um, if you get 20, the quality is probably pretty bad. VMAF was built by Netflix. Um, it's part of um, SSIM and PSNR are available in FFmpeg. VMAF can be added. You have to recompile FFmpeg to get VMAF added to it. Um, I had a lot of trouble getting VMAF um, recompiling FFmpeg to make it work. Um, but you would run an FFmpeg command like this with the small video. You compare it to the reference video, and then you run it through. There are a bunch of models. You can use a phone model or a TV model for VMAF, and you get different scores depending on things. Um, it does a frame by frame comparison. It's relatively expensive. This takes some time. This is not something that you can do just like that. It takes time. It's going to go through every single frame of your video. Um, however, because I had trouble work getting this to work, I actually built a tool that's online. You can go to streamclarity.com and you can put in your reference video, your transcoded video, the smaller one, and you can do a test your video quality. Here I'm just doing five seconds of video because like it takes time, it's expensive. So using Cloudinary, I can set just five seconds of the video. 
Um, so remember that video that I was showing you that was really, really big, that 70 megabyte video. When I resize that really, really big videos and still keep the really high quality, I make it 720p, um, just it's, so it's 1280 wide. Um, I get a VMAX score of 100. When I do all those quality uh, improvements, right? So I optimize for quality. Um, and then I can actually even make it smaller. I can make it to a 960 wide. I think that's 540 high. I can't remember. Um, I get a VMAX score of 99 to 97. So when I test this original vi the video that was huge on the web, and I do my quality optimizations, and even make the video smaller, I get a score above 95. And what that means is this video is indis indistinguishable from the original video. However, it went from 18 megabytes down to four and a half to three megabytes. And remember, the 1080p video was 77 megabytes or 73 megabytes. So the quality is still there. This video still looks awesome, but we know it's going to start up faster. It's less likely to stall, right? So it's going to start quickly. It's not going to stall, and it's going to look good. The three major analytics that we're looking for when it comes to video. So in conclusion, like there are a lot of, there weren't a lot of tools out there. I've tried to start building them. They're all open source, they're on GitHub. So if you have suggestions like contact me, I would love to work with folks, make them better. Um, you know, try them out, see what you think. So I've got stream or not. And what stream or not will do is it will actually measure how quickly your video starts and whether it will stall. The stream clarity tool will actually measure like from the original video to the one you've transcoded, is the quality still there? Um, FFmpeg is a free and open source tool. It's command line based. Um, if you're not testing your web pages, web page test, you really should be. And then I just like to thank Cloudinary. I use them for hosting all of the videos and for doing the optimizations that I did uh, for this talk. Um, so with that, thank you very much everyone for hanging out and joining uh, FrontConf virtually from all around the world. Um,